Well, let's continue our worship with the same excitement that they are continuing theirs. All right, guys, I don't know what you're trying to do to me here. I'm taking the hint, though. They, they give me a timer, and it says one minute. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to do that. I'm going to adjust this thing a little bit uh, to try to help myself out. But I am looking forward to our time together in God's Word. We're looking at uh, the book of Psalms together, and I'm admitting something to you that I'm doing uh, this series uh, for the church, of course, uh, but someone asked me the other day, uh, how long do you plan on doing this? Like, when are you moving on to the next thing? And uh, I said, I'm not really sure because <laughs> right now I'm kind of doing this for myself. There's this sanctified selfishness that is the unique prerogative of the pastor that's preaching on a weekly basis where um, he just goes to some particular text because that's what he himself needs and assumes that he's kind of like the rest of the congregation. Uh, so, I don't know, it could be a while. Right now, today, it's Psalm 16. We're taking it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So let's look at these few verses together. I'll begin reading with the superscription, which actually is a part of God's Word. A miktam of David, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'm reading this sentence from a book that's over 300 years old. But as you hear the topic, you're going to think that this is the kind of thing that we need this very day. Never doth a soul know about solid and substantial pleasure until, I'll read it again, never, never doth a soul know what solid and substantial pleasure is until, I'll fill in his statement in a moment, but let's just pause there. Solid and substantial pleasure. How would you fill in the blank? When does the soul know that? When does your soul know that? Uh, for some, they think that such pleasure is found in a bank account or a portfolio or uh, maybe some prized object in the backyard. Uh, for others, it's found in relationships or in a certain kind of status or accomplishment in the workplace. But for the heart of those who are in Christ, how should we fill in this statement? Henry Skugel, the author of this line, finishes it this way. I'll begin at the opening and conclude with his final thought. Never, never doth a soul know what solid and substantial pleasure is until 
once being weary of itself, it renounces all property and gives itself up to the author of its being. That's thick. (laughs) I'm going to read that last half again. It says, you know solid and substantial pleasure when you're weary of yourself to the degree that you renounce all property, everything that you own, and you give yourself up to the author of your being. The statement sounds right uh, for sure, and you know, one of the questions that we would need to ask ourselves is, okay, um, this Henry Skugel guy, like, is he the one that we really want to listen to in this? So is this truly uh, a happy guy? I mean, if we're talking about satisfaction, I want to hear this from somebody that himself was immensely satisfied. Now, for Skugel, for all intents and purposes, if you just look at his life historically, you're not thinking uh, much. He fa- in fact, he only lived to be 28 years old. He wrote this when he was 27. Uh, he was a pastor uh, for his adult life um, and would die prematurely on account of uh, tuberculosis. But what was interesting is that uh, this little book that he had written, which is called The Life of, of God and the Soul of Man, he, he would write this not for publication. He wrote this as he was dying to a friend who was discouraged, and he would write him a letter a week just to encourage him. So here's a guy facing death, trying to encourage one of his brothers in Christ. And unbeknownst to him, the brother was so encouraged by what Skugel had to say that he would take the letters and he would uh, publish them to other people, and eventually someone found it and turned it into a book. It was said eventually of Skugel that he was, and this is the, a great way to describe someone. It makes me want to listen to him on this point. That his whole soul seemed to be swallowed up in the sweet contemplation of Jesus Christ. Man, I wish I could be described that way. I was just the other day talking to one of the children, and I was telling them about something as dumb as me winning a competition several years ago of throwing a grape in my mouth. No kidding. It was dumb youth pastor stuff that I used to do. And uh, they were, the kids were listening to me regale my uh, you know, feats at catching grapes in mouth. And the, <laughs> uh, one of them said, uh, it hurt my feelings just a little bit, Dad, it sounds like you used to be, really be a fun person. <laughs> it's like, man, what kind of impression am I giving off? You know, like, <laughs> I don't enjoy life anymore. It seems that, that Skugel was the kind of guy that you would say, yeah, this is a really satisfied person. He really loved his life, and he attributed it directly to Jesus. It's one thing for us to learn from historical heroes and see, like, yeah, I want that. I want to be characterized by that level of satisfaction, that level of pleasure. I want people to see me as that happy uh, in the Lord. Uh, But the bigger question, though, is how do we get there? How do we get there? And this is where I'm grateful for the Psalms. They cover the full range of emotion. We've hit some pretty low lows of late in this particular book. But this one is where things begin to turn upward again. And what's so unique about Psalm 16 is it drips of pleasure language. But the circumstances don't lend themselves to pleasure. Like what you'll find in this text from reading it carefully is that it seems that the psalmist is actually facing his own death. There's this opening prayer where he says, preserve me, save me, rescue me, O God. And then he moves on to be praising the Lord. And right before he gets to the conclusion of the psalm, he will actually praise God for what he thinks he will provide for him at the moment of his very death when his body experiences corruption. It's one thing to write Psalm 16 after a beautiful vacation at the beach. It's something else to write Psalm 16 when sitting on your deathbed. And so with that in mind, I want you to see how this text unfolds for us 
the pleasures of God. There are several here, but just for the sake of our own understanding, I'm going to summarize these pleasures under two particular headings. The first is God's exclusive goodness. That's something that should bring us pleasure, His exclusive goodness. You'll see that in verses 1 through 6. And then the second particular pleasure by which we ourselves can be pleased is His eternal guidance in verses 7 through 11. His exclusive goodness and His eternal uh, guidance. Let's look at uh, this first pleasure that can be found in God in those first few verses. A miktam of David. I won't even comment on that because no one knows what that means. <laughs> Clearly, it's some kind of a musical term, but beyond that, we see that the opening line of this psalm is indeed a prayer. And it kind of sounds like most of David's psalms. God, protect me, preserve me. Uh, I, I'm, my, my life is threatened. <laughs> uh, David, by the way, just seems to be a guy that was always finding himself in a lot of trouble. He he prays this a lot, but what I find so interesting about this particular prayer is that he mentions it and he moves on. He just, it's like he knows he's in trouble and he needs to pray this, (laughs) but what he really wants to do is praise God for the ways that he's already delivering him. Notice how his confidence is betrayed even in the next line. He says, preserve me, O God. For in you I take refuge. He's saying, God, preserve me, and I am finding my safety in you. The the term taking refuge is used elsewhere in the Old Testament of a bird hiding itself in the crag of a rock, of a human actually fleeing into a cave in the midst of a storm. I mean, or even one of my favorites is actually that of a hardened soldier taking up a shield. The shield is his refuge. It is that which protects him. David is saying, God protect me, but I already know that you're my protection. I know that you stand between me and whatever threatens me. And so even in his prayer, he is expressing praise that God is the one who ultimately is providing for him in a special way. He says, for in you I take refuge. And then notice specifically uh, what he unpacks as this refuge, what he finds to be so protective in this life-threatening situation. Verse 2, he says, I say to the Lord, he begins to give a testimony here, and he's calling out Yahweh specifically, the God of the Bible. You are my Lord, and I have no good apart from you. You are my Lord, Now, when you see, uh, this is a great time to stick your your eyes in your Bible for a second, the word Lord, which is capital L, small o-r-d. When you see that, it is uh, typically in uh, literal translations like an ESV or a King James or um, an NASB, it's referring to a particular Hebrew word, Adonai. Um, Adonai is just that, that name of God that refers to his sovereign ownership and rulership over the world. It's kind of like the Greek word that we know, kurios. Uh, master, owner, ruler, boss, sovereign, whatever synonym you want to throw out there, is saying that God is my authority. He is in charge And this is a beautiful thing for David, whereas we kind of perceive sometimes like someone being over us as a threat to our autonomy and enjoyment. David actually expresses God's sovereignty over him as the source of his joy and safety. He says, you, Yahweh, are my God. You are my boss. You own me. And notice how he fills in the next line, in light of God's ownership over him. He says, I have no good apart from you. I mean, that is a beautiful rendering. Consider that for a moment. Whatever good you could possibly imagine for the psalmist does not exist apart from its relationship to God. I have no good. Good does not exist outside of you is a literal way to render this particular phrase. Or another translation puts it this way. You, Lord, you are my Lord, and it says my good, just as like another name of God. (laughs) He is my good, 
and I have none other beside you. So every good that he enjoys is from the Lord. And it's at this point where we want to make this a a little more practical because we wonder sometimes, okay, well, what does he mean by good? If he's in a life-threatening situation, it doesn't sound very good to me. Well, the word good here encompasses every type of good you could imagine, emotional good, spiritual good, and even physical good. He says, God, you're the source of every good thing that could possibly happen to me. Uh, This is the same word, I think, that's used in Genesis 50, 20, uh, where he says to his brothers, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it to me to evil, but God meant it for good. Think of all the good that he is referring to in that time, the saving of life, the the rescuing of a country, even Joseph's personal well-being. So I don't want you to dismiss good here, friends, to just the spiritual. Sometimes I think we emasculate the Psalms by trying to spiritualize something which wasn't actually supposed to be spiritualized. He wants you to think of any good thing that you could possibly think of, and he wants you to remember that it ultimately comes in relationship to God, to the Lord, the owner, the master, the ruler, the boss. And so this is why he's praising God as his exclusive good. He is pleased even in the midst of this trouble. And so he gives this opening statement. And notice this, how his, his praise for these pleasures that are offered by God extends from uh, the, what I'll call the vertical to the horizontal. Uh, what David enjoys isn't just the good things that come directly from God, But he also broadens this category out to God's goodness that he experiences through other people. And there's a group of other people in particular. In verse 3, it it names it. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Now that's a fascinating way to express praise to God. Uh, Normally, when we think of praising God, we think of thinking of Him only. Uh, We think of a third-person plural, I mean, uh, singular, you are my God. And yet here, He is expressing praise to God on account of the people around Him. Uh, The saints here is very similar to the way that it's used in the Old Testament. It just means holy ones. It's not talking about that which the Roman church canonized and put into some special category. It just means holy ones, those who are set apart. Who were the set apart people in this particular uh, grammatical and historical context? It would have been the Israelites. Uh, Those who also believed in Yahweh. He says, uh, the saints in the land... They are the excellent ones, the noble ones. He he views, this is fascinating to me, he views the other believers, I'll use that to modernize. He he views the other believers around him as just like the cream of the crop, the best that there are. He, He views them as royalty. That's actually the term here, excellent ones, the noble ones. He really loves the people of God to the degree that he says in them in whom is all my delight. Could you imagine, friends, if we actually viewed the believers around us as the source and expression of God's grace to us? Sometimes we think that other believers are some type of obstacle or hindrance to our enjoyment of God. So, man, you know, church would be really great if it wasn't for all these people. (laughs) And yet David, even in this Old Covenant context, actually sees an expression of God's goodness that is uniquely found in his relationships with other people who believe the same way as he he does. Uh, Friends, you need the people of God around you more than you imagine. This is one of those unexpected sources of the satisfaction of God. In times of trouble, in times of distress, it is easy for us and appropriate at times to withdraw and to be alone. And yet Satan would keep you there. And God ultimately would lead you into relationship with others because it is through that that his grace is known. David recognized this. He saw it as part of God's exclusive goodness. There is a special grace that the people of God have in their relationships with one another. 
I feel so sorry, and I'm, and I'm not saying this in an insulting way. This is truly my heart. I feel so sorry for those Christians who have been duped into believing that, uh, to quote George Jones, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Like those who, especially in a post-COVID or current COVID culture where they have truly isolated themselves and be like, oh yeah, I found the ticket. I can live stream. I don't need people. I've got podcasts. I've got Christian books. And yet, the text, even in the Old Testament, is saying, this is a unique pleasure that God offers you. And friends, you know this to be the case. It's kind of, I think that relationships, especially for introverts, are kind of like showing up to the gym. You never really want to go, but once you're there, you're glad you're there. <laughs> In a similar way, some of you are like, man, I'd be way better off by myself. But you know it's true. Once you get around the people of God, it was worth it. And so David is just extolling the pleasures of God, one of them interpersonally. But notice the contrast to the people of God. Look at verse 4. It says, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Now here we see a different group of people. This is fascinating to me because it mentions those who run after another God. Uh, the word run after there uh, in the Hebrew could also uh, be translated, interestingly, to buy or to acquire. This is the same word that's used in the book of Exodus uh, to talk about uh, purchasing a bride. Now, that's far into our own culture. <laughs> Uh, we don't really do that. There's no dowry, typically, that is extended uh, to the father of our beloved. And yet, there is a sense in which men still in this culture and generation uh, drop a good chunk of change uh, to enter into a marital relationship, and it typically consists of a rock on a ring. Uh, it is an expensive endeavor, at least to follow our own cultural norms, to enter into a, a marital uh, relationship. I'm sure you can get it done for cheap in Vegas, but I know that in most places, this is a rather expensive endeavor. And what you're recognizing in this is that there's some investment involved. What the psalmist is actually saying is that there's this other group of people who are, the text says, running after, but I would say buying after other gods. The text says another god. The word god isn't there. It just means another. Anything other than Yahweh. Anyone other than Yahweh. They're just spending, I would think of it this way, they're spending their souls, they're spending their lives, they're spending whatever capital they have on these other gods. Sometimes we assume that idolatry is a rather like uh, banal decision, you know, like, okay, well, it costs something to follow Jesus, but it'll pay off in the end. Uh, but idolatry, well, this is where all the pleasure is in this life, but, you know, ultimately the, 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 the downside and the penalty is in eternity. Even in this life, friends, there are costs associated with not following after Yahweh. He says these people are spending themselves that's why I very much uh, enjoy modern writers who do a good job at calling out idols of the heart. We have a little book on our back wall uh, by Tim Keller, who I don't agree with everything the man has ever written. The book Counterfeit Gods is fantastic. And he does a good job at actually showing like, what the modern idols are in our own day and how they cost something. I mean, think about people who worship at the altar of success. What does it cost them? It costs them their time and energy with their children. Uh, think of the young lady who, who worships at uh, the altar of sexual appeal. <laughs> uh, she is paying uh, beyond all recognition, at least like her own soul and satisfaction with the, like, the insecurity that comes from wanting to please the next person visually. I mean, these are like payoffs that are happening like right now in this very life. And so the psalmist is providing a contrast. He's saying, look, there is a unique joy that is only found in God. And I want you to know that there is this other group of people who are paying their souls <laughs> to another. And notice what happens. They pay all that money up front, and it says, here's the result, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. 
The word sorrows here is the same word that's used in the book of Job to refer to his sores. It is talking about the physical and emotional pain in this life of pursuing another. There is an exclusive goodness found in God. You can try to seek satisfaction elsewhere, and it may seem to be satiating in and of the moment, but friends, it is killing you. One of our interns was telling me the other day about a show that he watched in which it was uh, putting individuals through uh, survival scenarios. And I, I didn't know that this was actually a thing, but when people are actually stranded out in the ocean, there does come a time, even though mentally they know they shouldn't do it, where they drink the water. And it seems to, to slack the thirst for the moment, but it's killing them from the inside. They don't even realize that, that this is actually bringing them down. And I think that's what's happening in this psalm. He's warning us that don't drink the water. <laughs> don't find satisfaction here. It will multiply uh, sorrows. David says, I'll have no part of this. I will stay away from this. I, I know, as uh, one of the prophets says, that these are broken cisterns. Notice he says, their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. This is just uh, the, a modern way of saying that he will um, get out of Dodge when it comes to idolatry. He doesn't want anything to do with it. A uh, drink offering is an interesting thing. We'd, we don't we think of normally sacrificial offerings, but if you read Exodus and Leviticus carefully, uh, you learn that God also accepted drink offerings, which they would take uh, some type of wine that they would enjoy and literally pour it out, sacrificing it for them. They can't have it for themselves, <laughs> and they're saying this is for God. Uh, so in this particular case, he's saying, I'm not even going to participate in these drink offerings, and he makes it the, the idolatry seem uh, immensely disgusting because he talks about drink offerings of blood. And we don't have any instance of a drink offering of blood uh, accounted for us in the Old Testament. The Jews certainly didn't do this, but it does seem to be a unique offering associated with those who were idolaters. And he's saying, this is disgusting, this is nasty, I don't want anything to do with their drink offerings of blood. And then he adds, I won't even take their name on my lips. To take one of the gods' names on their lips, by the way, would mean that uh, he doesn't even want to acknowledge their existence. He doesn't even want to speak in such a way that would uh, concede that they are a thing. And it's interesting, the two gods of this particular time frame uh, that would have been most on the lips of their pagan neighbors would have been Moloch and Baal, uh, both of whose names in and of themselves actually denote a unique capacity of God. Moloch means king, Baal means creator, and neither one of those things David would even say. So I'm not even going to acknowledge their existence. And friends, I think what we see here is that this is the picture of a satisfied man. He's not looking to worship in other places. He finds exclusive joy in God and in his people. And now notice how he brings this around to a practical note in verse 5. And this is a beautiful picture. He says, the Lord, that's all caps, Yahweh, is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. And there's that famous passage. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Notice what David finds is the satisfaction in ultimately. It isn't just in the stuff that God has given him. It isn't just in the spiritual benefits that he enjoys as an individual. He actually traces the stream all the way back to the spring. He goes from the ray to the son himself, and he says, here's what I ultimately enjoy. Here's where it's at. You want the secret to satisfaction? It's Yahweh. Yahweh is my chosen portion. That is the word that would refer to the allotment of land, particularly in the book of Judges. You remember that. They were to come in, they were going to conquer their land, and God told them ahead of time, Hey, you're going to get this uh, particular place. Uh, this tribe's going to get this one. This tribe's going to get that one. But do you remember that there was actually a certain uh, group that didn't get any land? And you would be tempted to think that they were ripped off. It was the Levites. They were the priests. 
And what's so fascinating, in the explanation of why they don't receive land, the text tells us that Yahweh will be your portion. You will enjoy God in such a unique way that it will be more enjoyable than them with their physical dirt on the ground. He says, you're you. And David, by the way, is of the tribe of Judah, but he knows that ultimately it wasn't the land of Judah that he was really concerned about. His real pleasure, his real satisfaction was in the person of God. He says, you're my chosen person. He noticed and he also says, you're my cup. Uh, that means uh, very little to most of us because we're like, oh, a cup, it's a cup. <laughs> but a cup in the Old Testament was actually a metaphor for one's destiny. Uh, there's another passage in, um, in Psalms, I forgot the exact reference, in which uh, he talks about the cup of the wicked. I think it's Psalm 11 uh, being fire and brimstone. Their destiny, what they will get in the end is fire and brimstone. Uh, another positive example of this is Psalm 23. He says, my cup runneth over. Do you remember that, that famous psalm? He's saying, it is, it is destined for me to experience abundance. Or I'll give you one more just to help you. Remember Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane? And he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. What cup was he referring to? This destined suffering? And here the psalmist says, here's my cup, it's Yahweh. He's my destiny. It even says that he holds my lot. This is cool to me. Because again, we don't use these words that often. Sorry, I have to do so much explaining, but there's a little bit of a cultural gap here. Think of lots in the Old Testament, casting lots. (laughs) Again, another statement of the future. Decisions were made actually in Old Testament times as they did this. And nobody really knows what it looked like to cast lots. And so we try to just... Uh, modernize it by saying drawing straws or throwing dice. Either one of those things represent for us some type of like uh, fortuitous things. That some future decision is going to be made outside of our ability to control. Casting of lots were that very thing. In the book of Proverbs, it says that God oversees the casting of the lot. And so what David is saying here in particular, he says, you hold my lot. You hold my destiny. Everything that will ever happen to me, however the dice are rolled, whatever straw is drawn, ultimately, you've got it. I'm satisfied. And then there's this uh, line that has always confused me because of its use of the word line. <laughs> I've read this my whole life. I'm embarrassed to say this, uh, but I am in my mid to upper 30s at this point. And I've read this passage who knows how many times, and I have never known what it means to, when the text says, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I'm a literalist. So I just imagine like lines being drawn up, and I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> how, do, how do geographical shapes have any you know, determination on like my enjoyment of God? And then thankfully, I finally understood, some of you know this better than I, but it's actually following the metaphor from earlier about God being his portion. It's talking about the allotted territorial lines. He says, the lines that you have drawn up for me, like my destiny, what I will enjoy is beautiful. It is pleasant. They they have fallen in pleasant places. I don't know about you. Um, But in this uh, world in which we live, it's easy for us to be uh, just captivated at times by property. We think about it even in this culture, like um, home prices are high. People look to move into a particular neighborhood. And anytime you click on that picture of a particular house or location, it'll give you the boundary lines. (laughs) And for us in the 21st century West, that's our choice. We get to choose to live in this zip code versus that zip code. We like this yard versus that yard. Uh, We we know what it's like to have uh, some say in our geographical destiny, if you will. And yet here, you got to think about an Old Testament uh, paradigm. Uh, They don't get to go move wherever they want. God said, here's your boundaries, live here. And so if they had a great spot... (laughs) It was just all the goodness of God. And if they had a not-so-great spot, guess what? It was just his choosing. So here David is saying, 
the lines that you drew up for me, this thing that I couldn't control myself, uh, the territory border (laughs) that you drew around my life is pleasant. It is beautiful. It is nice. It is good. He is just basking in the goodness of God. And he even exclaims, indeed, uh, 6b, I have a beautiful inheritance. Uh, Friends, I think that we would do well to reflect as believers in Christ about the grace of God that has been extended to us. In the seminar earlier, David did a wonderful job at recapping the ways that God has revealed himself to mankind. And the two major theological categories that we think through in God's revelation typically consist of God's general revelation and his special revelation. Did you know you could take those same two categories and apply them to God's goodness? There is a way in which God is generally good to all people everywhere, and there are ways in which He is specifically good to His people. And I think David here is praising God for both. He realizes that generally speaking, the fact that he enjoys rain and sunshine, day and night, health, and food, and relationships. He knows that all of that comes from God. They are the springs, I mean the streams, and God is the spring. He is the source. But on top of that, I think that David also has in mind his unique privilege and status as one who is one of the special people of God. He thinks of those uh, spiritual benefits uh, that don't come to mind as naturally, which is why Paul often prays, by the way, in the New Testament, that God would open our eyes to the goodness of God, that we would see and appreciate and know all of the spiritual benefits that he's offered for us. And so David is inviting us here to say, and remember, that you as a believer in Christ, if indeed you are in Christ, enjoy some exclusive goodness. There are some things that because you're in Christ that no others actually enjoy. Sure, some people may have more money than you, or more property than you, or more prestige than you. But whatever property or possessions or prestige you may have even now, that came from God. And even beyond the stuff, think about what God has done for your soul. The benefits are good. I've said this to you before, and I think it's a good thing for us to remember. Anything above hell is grace. I mean, we recognize what we ultimately deserve on account of our rebellion against God, and then we contemplate what we do enjoy? This is an exclusive and unique goodness. Be pleased in this, friends. It would be easy to point to all the holes and all the problems, but for a few moments, God is directing our attention to this particular pleasure, His exclusive goodness. But He doesn't stop there. He continues in verses 7 through 11 to uh, particularize another pleasure, and that is God's eternal guidance. Not just His goodness, but His guidance. Look at verse 7. He says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Bless just means to speak good things to God. He's particularly, again, referring to Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And he says that God gives him counsel. And notice the second part of the verse. In the night also my heart instructs me. Uh, David recognizes that God guides him in a unique way. Uh, God guides him. Uh, and this, it, the expansion here is rather interesting. In the night, my heart also instructs me. How does God guide you? How does God guide his people? This is a great question, especially for anyone trying to make a major life decision. I mean, you have to make these decisions on a regular basis. Do I work in this place or that place? Do I marry this person or that person? Do I go to this school or that school? Well, we need to remember that God has um, this unique way of working and guiding us through his word. David would have been primarily thinking about God's special revelation in the word. What he had at that time was Torah. Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. Uh, The Hebrew word Torah means instruction. When he is talking about guidance, instruction, he is talking about what God has guided. Uh, Friends, 
you have Torah, you have God's Word. He has told you what really matters. Sometimes when you get in the weeds of whether to take this project or that project or to date this person or that person or to buy this stock or that stock, uh, you're, you're actually taking the focus off of what is already clear. Start with the clear and then go to the unclear. Uh, for the person who's like, I don't know if God wants me to, to serve in China, and they pray and they pray about that. <laughs> uh, I heard a story of one in particular who was praying about this very event, and it says that uh, while they were praying about uh, China, they were walking through their kitchen and they slipped on a banana peel, <laughs> and they fell. And on it uh, was actually a map of China and the floor, and they saw that as God directing them to China, Somebody clearly made this up. <laughs> and the author actually pointed out, that, no, maybe God's will for you is just to clean your kitchen. <laughs> you know, like we're all the time looking for like these special signs of instruction. And guess what? What really matters is clear. Have you placed your faith alone in Jesus alone? <laughs> uh, are you trying to obey him? Some of you, by the way, uh, or maybe say, I am in Christ, but I have not yet done the more basic thing of being baptized or following Him in the company of His church by being a part of it. These are basic. These are normal. These are real. These are ordinary. Do what God has made clear and then pursue the unclear. So God works through the canon of Scripture. But then David also allows for conscience. Notice this. He says that there's these times in which in the night, he says, my heart also instructs me. If you've got a, a Bible with a little number there, you can follow it to the bottom. This is interesting. It says, my kidneys instruct me. Uh, many a woman in this church knows what it means for your kidneys to instruct you in the night <laughs> as you make multiple trips to the bathroom. But I do not think that that is what the author has in mind in this particular point. When he says, my kidneys, he is referring to the, the internal part of him. I don't know about you, but I do have certain seasons in which I have extended sleepless nights, and I typically find that it is in those moments that there is some area of special need that deserves more prayer and time and attention. <laughs> it's almost as if God is saying to me, uh, all right, if you're not going to pray about it during the day, I'm going to make sure you pray about it at night. David, throughout the Psalms, by the way, constantly talks about the night seasons. And every other time it's mentioned throughout the Psalms, it is associated with prayer. Friends, I'm not promising that God is going to lead and guide you through your dreams. All I'm saying is that He works through the canon of Scripture, and sometimes He can be working and guiding you through a disturbed conscience at night. But both of these things are actually an expression of His goodness to you. He is guiding you. He is leading you. He has not abandoned you. He has spoken into your situation through His Word. David continues to extol this goodness of God's guidance in verse 8. Notice what he says, I have set Yahweh, or the Lord, always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I notice that. It's, it's like God is always in front. He, he keeps God in front of him. That's where leaders go, in the front. So he's saying, I have set the Lord always before me. I'm always trying to follow behind him. I want him to be first. And then notice this, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. You're probably thinking, well, what does it matter if he says right hand or his left hand? Well, right hand was the position of prominence. Think about it. In a court, and when you were like in a court, like a kingly court, the person who sat to the right was the king's chief advisor. <laughs> when he says here that Yahweh is at my right hand, he is saying that Yahweh is my chief advisor. I go to him first when I'm trying to make a decision. It's him that I'm relying on. He's my go-to. <laughs> He's my go-to. Friends, when you get in those moments of duress, when you're trying to plan out your life, uh, what is your North Star and what is your go-to? The North Star would be that thing that is, is the, the number one thing that guides all other things, the, the thing, the decision by which you make all other decisions. For some people, it is how much money you make or what this will mean for your family. 
for some, it's God. What would please him? What would expand his kingdom? North Star, and then your go-to. When you get in those moments where things don't go according to plan, where you like laid it all out and you thought in five years you were going to be here and then you end up in a ditch somewhere, what do you then reach for? What do you depend on to get you out? For some, it's food. For some, it's uh, buying stuff. For some, it is relationships. For some, it is social media or streaming media. And for some, it's Yahweh. He's at their right hand. And what he says in light of this, of God being his north star, God being at his right hand, being his go-to, is that because of this, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I am established. My life is solid. God is guiding me in great ways. I say this to my wife all the time. I feel like we are regularly millimeters away from a horrific decision. I look back at decisions and I'm like, man, I could have gone here versus there. or I could have, you know, trained at this place versus that place. I mean, like, there's, and I just look back and we were like, we were always like this far away. <laughs> and I look and I'm thinking, thank you, God, for where you have put me. And I think to whatever degree, I know I haven't done this perfectly, but I know that generally speaking, God indeed has been my North Star. He has been at our right hand. And I can say this life is solid on account of him. Friends, the New Testament counterpart of this is what Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6. You remember this well, don't you? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things is he talking about? The basic needs of life, that which you need to live, just keep putting him first. He is your eternal guide. He leads you. He guides you. He shows you what's right. And sometimes it doesn't make any sense. It seems like, man, this will not lead to pleasure. This will not lead to good. This will not lead to stability. But give God's word a chance. It always turns out in the end. David says, God, you are my eternal guide. And notice this. His confidence in God's guidance takes him up to the very point of death. Look at verse 9. He says, therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Now, notice this. He's expanding upon what it means to not be shaken. And he says, my heart is glad. That internal part of me, there's, there's gladness there. My whole being rejoices uh, this means, again, the internal part of me. And notice my flesh dealing more with even his body. He says, my flesh dwells secure. Uh, that phrase means just to lie down and to have rest. He is at peace. This guy is totally at peace. Why? Look at verse 10. Here's the reason why. This is why he's so secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. There's uh, three ways that interpreters through the years have tried to uh, interpret verse 10. It's kind of tricky. In its original context, uh, some people will assume, typically liberals, will assume that, well, David really had no understanding of God being able to work in supernatural ways. Uh, Old Testament uh, believers didn't actually believe in any form of resurrection. That's a New Testament idea that was opposed upon the Old Testament text. And so David here is just merely praying that God would deliver him from death, that he wouldn't die a premature death. But there's a lot of assumptions in that. So I'm not going to go the materialist route. Let's just take the text for what it says. Here's what it says. I'm confident because... God will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let his holy one, literally faithful one, see corruption. Uh, friends, I, I don't know like how you're reading this. I'm not trying to do reader response here, but I'm just trying to be fair with the text. It looks like to me that David has zero expectation of being fully and finally abandoned to the grave. Sheol is the Hebrew place of the dead, often associated with uh, torment and punishment. And he's saying, I'm, I'm, that's not going to happen to me. I will not be abandoned to this. 
He says, nor will you let your holy one see uh, corruption. Uh, look at your, again, these are fascinating, these little numbers sometimes that have alternate translations. So you find the six there and you go to the bottom and it says the pit. <laughs> it is literally talking about a pit into which bodies are thrown and decay happens. That's why the word corruption is even used here. David's saying, I'm not going to be left in this state. So I don't think David here is just merely saying, okay, God, you're going to get me out of hard places so that I don't die this time, but I die at the right time. I don't know about you, but I'm not like cheering in my seat reading that. They're like, oh, okay, well, I get a few more days. <laughs> I think David actually has something more in mind here. He, he's expecting something uh, beyond uh, the just premature death. He's expecting full and final deliverance from death. And the reason why I know this to be true, not just on account of what I see in other places in the Old Testament, but the passage that we read earlier in which we had apostolic interpretation of this very psalm, we understand that there would be one who would actually experience death, who would go to the grave, and would not suffer corruption. In Acts 2, I want you to understand this, because this is kind of like the climax of, of this particular passage, is this is like extending some hope that there would be one who would beat the ultimate enemy of death. I don't care what you enjoy in this life, friends. Spiritual, I mean emotional, relational, physical, financial. It's all going away one day if death gets its way. I mean, you want to talk about pleasure, you just can't be too happy if there's a time limit on all these things. And so we have to figure out a way to get past the death part. And this is what the text is speaking to. The reason why Peter was able to preach so authoritatively on that day of Pentecost and call people to repent of their sin and confess Jesus is because there finally was someone who physically had overcome man's greatest enemy, death. And he said, listen to this one. Nobody's ever beat this before. Here's the true fulfillment of what was prophesied so long ago in Psalm 15. Basically, what they read in Psalm 15, they were like crossing their fingers and hoping that, okay, I hope what God says is true, but nobody's ever been able to prove it. <laughs> I hope that God will one day deliver us from death. I'm just trusting him on that. And then finally, one would come, a descendant of David who would overcome death. His body would not see corruption. He was delivered from the grave. After suffering and dying, he would rise again and show that he was the ultimate fulfillment of what was here. And so we have not only a materialist interpretation of this verse, but a messianic one that points ahead to someone. God and his eternal guidance would provide us one who would steer us through death to the other side in eternal life which allows us to take an eschatological application. So you can look at a materialist interpretation and then uh, a messianic uh, examination and take this to its final step, which is an eschatological application. What does this mean for us in the end? Well, hey, yeah, sure, friends, you will not die prematurely. But again, I'm not cheering much on that one. But I can tell you this, that when you do die, this text tells us that he will guide us through death to the eternal life that will follow thereafter. You who are followers of Yahweh through faith in Jesus Christ will not suffer ultimate defeat on account of death. This is why David is so confident. I love the last verse. It leads us through death to what? Notice verse 11. This guidance takes us all the way home. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's where he's guiding us, friends. That's where I say eternal guidance. It isn't just the temporal things. God will guide you to his very presence in which there are pleasures forevermore. I want you to take the best five minutes of your life and think about it. I mean, I'm talking like the, the cream of the crop. When you do reach your deathbed and you think back to the best five minutes, 300 seconds of your life, what was it? I'll take that. And multiply it by a thousand. 
and then spread it through eternity future. And you're just beginning to grasp what it will be like to enjoy the presence of God. That's where he's leading his people. That's where he's guiding us. To himself. I am delighted that heaven one day will be a a recreated earth. (laughs) I love the temporal things of this life. I love that I'll be reunited with friends and family. But friends, at the end of the day, what makes the future so great is God himself. Everything else that you find to be so sweet, so alluring, so good, it's just the ray and he's the sun. It's just the stream and he's the spring. And you'll swim in it one day. This is where he guides you. As I think about our options of finding this eternal satisfaction, uh, experiencing this everlasting pleasure, I'm reminded of uh, the words of the old preacher I like to listen to from time to time, the Southern Baptist, uh, Adrian Rogers. I think it's this Southern accent that just kind of draws me in. And he had such great one-liners. I'll leave you with this one. He says, what's really important in this life is what money can't buy and death can't take away. (laughs) That's a good way to say it. When you're thinking about how to fill in the blank on what will draw pleasure, your answer better fit that paradigm. What is it that money can't buy and death can't take away? It's a relationship with God enjoyed through Jesus Christ. Uh, This God who gives us exclusive goodness and this God through whom we enjoy eternal guidance. I don't know everyone here today. Every Sunday I see people I don't know. But I would plead with you if you're here and you're wondering what it means to enjoy God in this way and that seems to be something that's absent from you, my quick plea to you is to identify the source. I know that you know temporal happiness from many different avenues and ways, but follow it all the way back up to His source It comes from God. And think about it. You enjoy it despite your sin and rebellion against Him. But you will only enjoy it in this life. Did you know that the New Testament says that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? You know why God has been so kind to you? He is drawing you to Himself. He wants you to understand that you will thrive most in relationship with him. And your sin stands in the way. But if you but repent of that, turn from that, and you trust in the finished work of his son, you will enjoy him not only in this life, but eternally in the life to come and avoid the eternal perdition and damnation that comes to all those who rebel against him. Identify the source. If you want to know more about that, what it means, please talk to me. Talk to whoever invited you. And if you're here and you're in Christ, you know what it is to enjoy the pleasures of God. I've given you a great homework assignment today. Just keep enjoying Him. Keep enjoying Him. Don't look to the broken cisterns of sin. Just continue to find your satisfaction in Him and Him alone. And God has given us three means by which we can enjoy Him in this special way. Of course, there's just the goodness of His creation that happens regularly. But the means of grace that He has offered for us to experience this are His Word, prayer, and the church. Uh, Friends, we need to be reminded sometimes that all the good that we do enjoy ultimately comes from God. Stay in His Word. Be informed by His Word. It reminds us of what really matters and what good really is pray. I do find it just so illuminating that Paul was regularly praying for people to know, to comprehend the goodness of God. I think we would be wise to pray in similar ways. If your heart is down and you find yourself a a little more uh, morbid than usual, I would encourage you just to spend some time praying that God would 
open your eyes to his beauty, that he would open your ears to the symphony of his grace. And in the church, one of God's greatest gifts to you is in his people. And I know we're broken, and I know we mess it up sometimes, but the net gain, you know, out, I mean, outshines the loss. Continue to enjoy the special people of God who are characterized by belonging to churches just like this one, regularly listening to the preaching of the gospel and practicing the ordinances of baptism and communion. This is what marks out that special community. This is God's grace to us. Friends, the the Puritans used to call Sunday the market day of the soul. There were no grocery stores, so whatever good things you wanted for your family, you had to get on Sunday. Uh, when you went to market. Friends, what we have in in this gathering is a market. It isn't just this sermon. It is everything that surrounds it. It is the singing. It is the prayers. It is the reading. It is the people. It is the communion. Uh, There's so much good that comes from this, and I just say, get what you need today. Enjoy God's grace in this gathering. And we're going to do that even now. One of the tangible reminders that God has given us of His grace is communion. 